Um, so thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Arena, for inviting me to give this talk and for uh, introducing me. Um, yes. So the talk I'll give today is not really about combinatorics, but I will have a few pictures of polygons on my talk. So hopefully this will suffice. Um, yeah, I hope you guys still find this interesting. Um, so before I talk about the actual LP dual Minkowski problem, let me start by introducing a few important and famous uh, cases of Minkowski problems. And naturally, uh, it's probably best to start with a classical case. So uh, some of you might be familiar with this. This problem was posed by uh, Minkowski himself a really long time ago. And basically it asks uh, what type of measures on the unit sphere can be the surface area measure of some convex body. Um, so here I've drawn an example of a solution to a Minkowski problem with this given data. So let's say the given data mu is discrete and concentrated on five unit vectors. Um, then if there is a solution to the Minkowski problem, uh, the solution in 2D should look like a five-sided polygon um, since mu is discrete uh, with faces of outer unit normal u sub i having a surface area a sub i. Okay, so um, the classical Minkowski problem was solved uh, again a really long time ago. Minkowski himself uh, provided a solution to the existence problem for polytopes. And then later on, Alexandrov and Fenchel and Justin uh, were able to generalize uh, the solution uh, using a variational approach. So they were able to prove this for all convex bodies. Okay, um, now before I introduce the next uh, Minkowski type problem, let me start by introducing a geometric measure that will be relevant for the rest of this talk. Um, so the integral curvature measure. So this is for convex bodies, um, defined for convex bodies and Borel subsets of the unit sphere. Uh, this integral curvature measure was introduced by Alexandrov in 1972. And uh, basically it's uh, defined as the measure of the radial Gauss image of uh, the input omega for your convex body kit. Okay, so we take the measure of this. Um, so in words, uh, this can be thought of as the measure of the normal cone of the radial projection to the boundary of the convex body. Okay, um, so this is all probably best explained by a picture. So I have one here. Um, so let's say your convex body K is uh, given by this blue figure here. And uh, the Borel subset of the unit sphere is given by this purple arc, um, omega. So what we do first uh, for calculating the integral curvature measure um, is extend uh, or project the unit vectors in omega radially to the boundary of your convex body. So here, uh, if we extend u1 and u2 till it touches uh, k, we will end up with these two red points. And for the rest of the uh, vectors in omega, you will get this sort of arc in the convex body if you extend them radially. Okay, now these points on the convex body are each going to have tangent planes to them. And each of these tangent planes are going to have outer unit normals. Okay, so imagine doing this for all the points in this arc. Uh, from here, we will transfer all of these vectors to the unit sphere. Um, and what we will end up with is alpha sub k of omega or the radial Gauss map of uh, omega for the convex body k, okay? And the integral curvature measure is just given by the measure of this uh, orange arc here for this example, okay? So, um, great. Uh, the picture is going to look slightly different for polygons slash polytopes. Um, I think it's a pretty nice example. So here I have a pentagon, um, where the exterior angles are concentrated on these uh, unit vectors u sub one through u sub five. Okay, so basically what I mean is that when you extend each unit vector, uh, it should extend radially to a vertex 
and the corresponding integral curvature measure uh, at this unit vector is going to be given by the measure of this exterior angle here, okay, where these exterior angles are bounded by um, the outer unit normals of the uh, adjacent faces to the vertex. Okay, so yeah, for polytopes, um, the integral curvature measure is going to be discrete and concentrated on all of these uh, unit vectors, um, and it's given by this formula here. Okay, so uh, basically, um, for polytopes, I think it's pretty easy to see that the total integral curvature measure um, of any polytope is going to equal to uh, the surface area of the n-dimensional sphere. And um, yeah, this also applies to general convex bodies, um, also pretty easy to see. Okay. So um, now it's pretty natural to pose the corresponding Minkowski problem for this geometric measure. Um, this is known as the classical Alexandra problem uh, posed by Alexandrov in 1972. So it's the same type of question. Uh, we ask uh, what type of measures on the unit sphere can be the integral curvature measure of some convex body, okay? So again, here's the definition um, and here's the picture. If mu is concentrated on the same five unit vectors as before um, with corresponding values, alpha sub one through alpha sub five, um, then if the Alexandra problem for this given data has a solution, it should look like a five vertice um, polygon in 2D. Okay, so this is all assuming we're in 2D, uh, where again, if we uh, extend each use of i, they should extend radially to a vertex, and the exterior angle um, at that vertex should measure alpha sub i. Okay, so um, the Alexandra problem was solved by Alexandrov in 1942. Uh, he did this first for polytopes and then generalized it to arbitrary convex bodies using a topological argument. Um, he also looked at uniqueness. So to what extent is the solution to the Alexandra problem unique given certain data? Um, and it turns out that it's unique up to scaling. Okay, so um, the next Minkowski type problem I will introduce is the log Minkowski problem. So here, uh, this is a very famous Minkowski problem, also largely unsolved, even though uh, after I pose this question, you might think that it doesn't seem too hard to solve. Um, so here it asks uh, what type of measures on the unit sphere can be the cone volume measure of some convex body. Okay, so if you're not uh, familiar with the cone volume measure, um, it's also known as the L0 surface area measure, and I've defined it here. Um, for the discrete case, this is uh, pretty easy to see what this all means. So 1 over n times the support function times the surface area measure. Um, in the discrete case, uh, basically, if you have a face with outer unit normal use of i, then the cone volume measure evaluated at that face or that, sorry, outer unit normal is going to be given by the sort of cone volume uh, at this face. Okay, so yeah, if uh, we have a discrete measure concentrated on five unit uh, vectors, the solution should look like a five-sided figure um, with corresponding cone volumes uh, matching the data. Okay, so yeah, this problem is largely unsolved. Um, some cases are known though, like for example, if your given measure is uh, symmetric, um, this has been solved. And also uh, the discrete case uh, and planar and even case has also been solved. Okay, so um, now uh, before I talk about the general L dual Minkowski problem, I would also have to review a few things about L dual Minkowski theory and convex geometry. Um, basically just defining um, some things. 
Okay, so first let's start with the definition of the LP sum. So this is sort of a generalization of the ordinary Minkowski sum. Um, this was defined by Fiery in 1962. And uh, he defined it for every P greater than or equal to one. Um, if we have two convex bodies, uh, then we define the LP sum of these two convex bodies by uh, its support function. So the support function of the LP sum is given by a function of the support functions of K and L themselves. Okay, so just this formula here. Um, notice that when P is equal to one, one, this just turns into the normal Minkowski sum. Okay, so um, yeah, Fiery defined this for P greater than or equal to one. Uh, P less than one was defined later, um, so you can generalize this. Uh, when P is less than one, notice that convexity of the uh, support function of the LP sum is no longer guaranteed. So to fix this, uh, we will basically take the wolf shape of uh, this support function. Okay, so in case we are unfamiliar with the wolf shape, uh, so for continuous functions positive on the unit sphere, uh, we define the wolf shape by this formula. Um, geometrically, you can think of this as uh, if you have a positive continuous function on the unit sphere, um, you can sort of take this as the support function of some shape. And then uh, the wolf shape would be the largest convex body that is within this uh, shape defined by the support function, okay? So yeah, basically this wolf shape makes non-convex things convex. And uh, this would fix the issue of the P less than one case. And uh, this is how the LP sum is defined. Um, now, L.P. Brahm-Minkowski theory was not actively researched until Erwin Lutwak in 1993 discovered the concept of the L.P. surface area measure. So, yes, this is the generalization of the regular surface area measure, and uh, it's defined by a variational formula. So, if you have two convex bodies, uh, K and L, then similar to how surface area, ordinary surface area, is just defined by a variation on the volume. So it's basically just the derivative of the volume. Um, we can define the LP surface area measure by also a derivative of the volume, except instead of taking the ordinary Minkowski sum in here, we will take the LP sum in the variation. Okay, so let's differentiate this. And on the other side, we will end up with an integral involving the LP surface area measure. So this is for P non-zero and this is for P is equal to zero. Um, this L zero surface area measure is actually turns out to be the cone volume measure we've discussed uh, a little bit earlier in this talk. Um, and when P is equal to one, you'll notice that uh, you'll end up with the familiar variational formula for ordinary surface area measure. Okay, so um, yes, with every geometric measure, there is, we can naturally pose a, a Minkowski type problem again. So here uh, we pose the Minkowski problem, uh, which basically asks uh, what type of measures on the unit sphere can be the LP surface area measure of some convex body. Okay. Um, so what's interesting about this problem is that it sort of interpolates between some important cases of uh, Minkowski problems uh, that have a geometric interpretation. So for instance, when P is equal to one, the LP surface area measure becomes the ordinary surface area measure and we end back at the classical Minkowski problem. Um, when P is equal to zero, this becomes the cone volume measure. And so we end up uh, posing the log Minkowski problem. And when P is equal to negative N, uh, uh, basically this case is also very difficult. It's known as the central affine Minkowski problem, uh, widely studied, um, still largely unsolved. So yeah, the LP Minkowski problem links between several important cases of Minkowski problems. And a lot is known about it, but 
of course, it's still not completely solved. Um, so here's the progress. Basically, when P is greater than one, uh, Lutzwak and Olaker uh, first solved the even case, and then Cho Wang came along, and then they were able to solve the general case, uh, I think using PDEs. Um, when P is equal to one, we've discussed this before, um, so I will skip this. And uh, when P is less than one, things get more complicated and interesting. So again, the long Minkowski case and the central affine case are included in this region. So it makes sense why uh, this would be a lot more complicated. Um, so this was investigated by several people. Um, I've listed some names here, but I'm sure there are more who've uh, researched in this area. Okay, so uh, we've just discussed LP Bremen Cusky theory. Now let's talk about another variant of Bremen Cusky theory known as dual Bremen Cusky theory. So uh, basically, um, regular Bremen Cusky theory is useful in answering questions about projections of convex bodies, while dual Bremen Cusky theory is more useful in answering questions about intersections. And I guess we will see why here. So an important measure uh, in dual bremen kuski theory is the m minus q dual prayer mass integral uh, of a convex body. And um, this is also sort of a generalization of the volume. OK, so here, uh, this is the formula, um, an integral formula for the m minus q dual prayer mass integral. Um, you can think of it as basically a uh, bridge um, of integrating the cute dimensional intersection areas of your convex body over the uh, entire resume. Okay, so um, there's a pretty easy extension to apply to all real Q instead of just natural numbers, and it's using a sort of polar formula. So yeah, using a sort of polar formula, you can get uh, something that looks like this for all real Q. And yeah, so notice that when Q is equal to N, uh, the N minus Q dual prayer mass integral becomes the volume of a convex body. Okay, so um, from here, uh, it's natural to try to differentiate uh, this functional, uh, this N minus Q dual prayer mass integral. And that's exactly what Wang LYZ did in 2016. So differentiating the M minus Q uh, dual queer mass integral. Um, and uh, they take a variation of the L0 sum uh, of this. And on the other side, uh, we end up with uh, what's known as the Q dual curvature measure of your convex body. Okay, so again, another variational formula to end up with an important geometric measure. Okay, the uh, Q is equal to zero case uh, looks slightly different. Um, I gave the formula here. Um, so yeah, the uh, M minus Q dual quarter mass integral becomes the what's known as the entropy. And it's given by this integral of the log of the support function. And after differentiating, uh, we end up with the zero uh, dual curvature measure of your convex body. Okay, so uh, we might wonder why is dual bremen kuski theory called dual bremen kuski theory? And if you want to look into this, um, I believe this is mostly easily seen um, by looking at the sort of Steiner type formulas that arise from. Uh, uh, these concepts here. So basically in the Steiner type formulas, the rules of the support function and the radial function are interchanged. And also you sort of replace the Minkowski sum by the radial sum and uh, yeah, duality sort of becomes evident there. Uh, all in all, yes, the rules of the support function and radial function are interchanged. Okay, so um, again, uh, it's it's pretty natural to try to pose the corresponding Minkowski problem for these geometric measures, uh, the dual 
uh, curvature measures. And again, this dual Minkowski problem links between some important cases of um, Minkowski problems, both of which we discussed before. But anyways, uh, the dual Minkowski problem asks what type of measures on the unit sphere are uh, dual curvature measures of some convex body K. Okay. And uh, when Q is equal to zero, the dual curvature measure becomes the uh, integral curvature measure. And what we end up with is the Alexandra problem uh, we discussed earlier. And when Q is equal to N, the end uh, dual curvature measure becomes the cone volume measure. And we end up with the long Minkowski problem. Um, so yes, the dual Minkowski problem links between uh, or sort of interpolates between these two important cases here. Okay, so uh, as usual, this Minkowski problem has been pretty well studied. Um, so to list the progress, uh, when Q is less than zero, Yiming Zhao provided a complete solution to the existence question. And he also investigated uniqueness and was able to prove a result on this. Um, when Q is equal to zero, uh, we end up with the Alexandra problem, which as we discussed, Alexandra have completely solved. Um, and when Q is greater than zero, uh, it becomes a lot more challenging. Okay, so um, first of all, when Q is greater than zero, uh, the only results that are known are for even data cases or when your given data is symmetric. Okay. Um, and basically, I've listed the progress here. Um, several people have investigated this and found that there has to be a measure concentration condition for uh, existence. Um, yeah. OK, so finally, we uh, will be getting really close to the LP dual Minkowski problem. And uh, we will introduce the PQ dual curvature measure. So. What's important about this measure is that it links between the two measures we discussed um, in LP Brominkowski theory and in dual Brominkowski theory. So it provides a link between these two uh, sort of variants of Brominkowski theory. Um, so this PQ dual curvature measure is defined as follows. So uh, yeah, uh, for real P and Q and convex body K and L, uh, LYC in 2019, differentiated the M minus Q dual queer mass integral. Um, but in contrast to the dual curvature measure case, uh, instead of taking the L0 sum in here, uh, we take the LP sum. So this sort of generalizes that previous measure. And um, on the other side, we will end up with the PQ dual curvature measure after taking this uh, variation. Okay, so um this uh yeah this dual curvature measure has a pretty uh interesting relationship to the regular q dual curvature measure and namely it's absolutely continuous um or in other words sorry uh sort of relate them by scaling uh of a power of the support function okay so yes um this measure links between several important examples. So namely, when P is equal to zero, the PQ dual curvature measure becomes the uh, Q dual curvature measure. Um, when Q is equal to N, we end up with the LP surface area measure uh, discussed earlier. And when uh, Q is equal to zero, uh, we end up with the LP integral curvature measure. Um, or if we want something familiar, when P and Q are both zero, we end up with just the ordinary uh, integral curvature measure of the polar of K. Okay, so that's the uh, main thing about this PQ dual curvature measure to remember here. Okay, so um, since the PQ dual curvature measure uh, links between uh, these important geometric measures, um, the LP dual Minkowski problem is going between all of the Minkowski problems we've discussed before. Okay, so similar questions. 
Um, but yes, it unifies many types of Minkowski problems, namely the LP Minkowski problem, the Alexander problem, and the dual Minkowski problem, uh, which was previously never known to be linked uh, until uh, LYZ posed this question. Okay, so um, this problem has been well studied again. So Huang and Zhao in 2018 uh, were able to pro provide good solutions in several quadrants um, of P and Q. So namely when P is greater than zero and Q is less than zero, they were able to provide a complete solution to the existence question of the LP dual Minkowski problem. Um, P is greater than zero, Q is greater than zero, and P is not equal to Q. Um, they found a solution for symmetric measures. And uh, when P is less than zero, Q is less than zero, and P is not equal to Q, they were able to find a solution for even data that vanishes on all great subspheres. So yeah, um, in this quadrant, uh, um, this condition is pretty strong. Uh, basically, uh, you'll notice that this excludes polytopes. Uh, namely, um, in this solution here. Okay, and this p minus q, or p not equal to q may seem a little bit strange at first, but I will tell you later why um, this is sort of needed. Okay, so in 2019, then Bresky and Floater were able to solve uh, the p greater than one, q greater than zero case uh, completely. So they got rid of the even measure assumption. Uh, in Huang and Zhao, and also governed this P not equal to Q case. Um, and then Chen and Li in 2021 uh, used PDEs to completely solve the P greater than zero uh, half plane case, and also the P between zero and Q case. Uh, they were also to provide, uh, able to provide a complete solution uh, there as well. Okay, so all of this might be kind of hard to visualize what exactly has been done. So I provided a picture here of uh, the progress in this problem. So um, first, when P is greater than zero, Q is, is zero. Um, Huang and Zhao uh, provided a complete solution in this quadrant here. Okay, and uh, when P is greater than zero, Q is greater than zero. Huang and Zhao provided a complete solution here for symmetric measures and P not equal to Q, okay? Um, so yeah, still within this quadrant, Brasky and Fodor uh, came along and then they were able to uh, sort of take care of this region here. So when Q is greater than one, P is greater than, sorry, P is greater than one, Q is greater than zero. They got rid of the origin symmetry uh, assumption in Huang and Zhao and also the P not equal to Q assumption. Um, and then Chen and Li used uh, PDEs to completely solve this half plane uh, very recently. Okay. Um, and then uh, in this quadrant here, so this is when P is less than zero, Q is less than zero. Huang and Zhao uh, provided a solution for even measures that vanish on all great subspheres, a pretty strong condition for P not equal to Q. Um, and then Chen and Li, again, use PDEs to prove existence for this entire region uh, below this uh, sort of dotted line here. Okay, so this is P between zero and Q. Okay, um, and then uh, you'll notice uh, here that the LP dual Minkowski problem includes uh, several familiar cases. So when Q is equal to zero, this becomes the LP Alexandra problem, uh, which is also another uh, pretty well-studied question in convex geometry. Um, so the progress is listed here. Uh, when P is greater than zero, Huang LYZ provided a complete solution. Um, when P is less than zero, uh, things get more difficult because um, the estimates get a lot more uh, hairy. Um, so Yiming Zhao, uh, was able to provide a solution here in this region, uh, P between zero and minus one for discrete even measures. Um, and then recently uh, I provide a solution for the P in zero minus one case 
uh, getting rid of the discrete assumption uh, for even measures. And I also uh, found a sufficient measure concentration condition to guarantee existence uh, for the LP Alexandra problem uh, for the rest of the negative P cases. Um, when P is equal to zero, uh, so basically the X axis, um, we end up with the dual Minkowski problem, uh, familiar with this, discuss the progress here. And when um, Q is equal to N, we end up with the LP Minkowski problem uh, given by this vertical line here, uh, which we've also discussed before. So uh, one thing that uh, everyone will probably notice is that there hasn't been much progress made in this uh, quadrant here. Okay, so uh, this quadrant is the most challenging quadrant. Um, and yeah, so the results I will present today are uh, located in this quadrant here. Okay, so um, this was done recently. Uh, basically, uh, we provide a solution for uh, the case of the given data being symmetric and uh, these conditions P and Q. So P be being between minus one and zero, Q being less than one plus P and P not equal to Q. Um, and let's say the given data again is symmetric and finite, a broad measure on the unit sphere. Um, then there exists an origin symmetric convex body that is uh, where its P cubed dual curvature measure is equal to your given uh, data mu. Okay, and of course, we're going to require that your given data is not concentrated on any lower dimensional subspace, and this is to guarantee that your shape will close. Okay, so yeah, this is the main theorem, and I will tell you about uh, the proof. So um, this problem was solved uh, using a variational approach. So this is pretty standard for, for uh, solving Minkowski problems. Um, so basically what this entails is uh, converting the question into uh, an optimization uh, question, where the solution to this optimization of a functional will yield the solution to uh, your original Minkowski problem. Okay. And basically what this amounts to is choosing your optimization functional cleverly so that you will end up with um, this happening. Okay, so uh, basically we'll define a functional CPQ of uh, a convex body Q um, by the following. So uh, uh, for finite Borel measures mu on the unit sphere, so this would be your given data and real P and Q, uh, we define it by a multiplication of the support function uh, term and a radial function term. Okay, so uh, basically we choose this so that if you optimize this functional in some way, then the solution is going to yield the solution to the LP dual Minkowski problem. Okay, um, and this is typically done by some sort of a reverse engineering um, technique. Okay, so um, here is a lemma. So uh, I believe this was proved in Huang and Zhao before. So uh, suppose mu is symmetric on the unit sphere. And if your convex body satisfies this uh, scaling requirement, and uh, VPQ of K, uh, basically K is the optimizer to your optimization problem. Um, then K is going to be, uh, or K polar is going to be the solution to the LP dual Minkowski problem. Okay, so this is a lemma. Um, then another lemma, Wang and Zhao in 2018. Uh, basically, the difference between this one and the previous one is that they got rid of this uh, scaling assumption here. Okay, so yeah, we don't require scaling except we will have to require that P is not equal to Q. So as long as we have this, then the solution to the optimization problem of optimizing CPQ is going to give the solution to the LP dual Minkowski problem um, after some scaling and taking the polar. Okay. And why do we, 
do we require that P uh, not be equal to Q? Um, basically, when P is not equal to Q, uh, you'll notice that the two integral terms uh, in your original optimization functional are going to have different degrees of homogeneity, so different rates of scaling. And this affords you a sort of degree of freedom to get rid of the previous scaling assumption. So yeah, if P were equal to Q, we won't have this degree of freedom and um, it would just uh, not work out, at least using this approach here. Oh, sorry, can I just ask a stupid question? Yeah. So um, you said for a choice of functional on um, 5PQ, like it's mostly like sort of back solid reverse engineered. Is there like a natural like interpretation of this for like, I don't know, some nice specializations of P and Q? Um, hmm, that's a good question. Um, CPQ, um, not that I know of. There's no really sort of nice geometric interpretation, but it's a, it's right. a good question. Yeah, this right. was basically selected, um, sort of reverse engineering from right. the previous variational formulas uh, I've discussed before. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so um, here is the outline for the proof. So again, we use a variational approach. So we convert the original LP dual Minkowski problem um, to a maximization problem. Uh, so we're maximizing PPQ. Uh, and from here, we'll have to prove some sort of compactness theorem uh, of the maximizing sequence. Okay, so we have a sequence of convex bodies that converge to the maximizer of the uh, functional, then if we prove compactness, we will get convergence to a compact convex set. Um, and this uh, can be seen by the blash case selection theorem or a arzella ascoli type R uh, for functional analysis. Okay, so we now know after proving this step that uh, we get convergence to some compact convex set. However, we don't know that it does not degenerate, or in other words, we don't know that it doesn't collapse or that the origin remains in the interior of the limit. Okay, so that is these two points here, basically proving non-degeneracy of the limit. Um, and notice that if we're going to assume origin symmetry of the given data, then these two points uh, turn out to be equivalent to each other. So basically, if you prove one or the other, uh, you would be done. And this turns out to be the most difficult part of the proof. Um, okay. So, um, yes, let's get into the sketch. Uh, so we're maximizing, recall, uh, we're maximizing this PPQ functional I mentioned earlier, and we show existence of the maximizer Q. So again, uh, proving compactness of the maximizing sequence. In this case, uh, it's pretty easy. So notice that VPQ is a scale invariant. So this means that if you rescale every term of your maximizing sequence, it's going to make absolutely no difference. Um, so we're going to rescale it so that uh, the maximum radius of each term is going to be some constant, let's just say it's one, and we have compactness of the maximizing sequence. So therefore we get convergence to some uh, compact convex set Q naught, which uh, should be the maximizer to the optimization functional. Okay, so um, the next step is to show that VPQ, or sorry, that Q naught does not degenerate. Or in other words, that the origin remains in the interior of the limit. And to do this, we will use a contradiction approach. So let's say that it does degenerate, or in other words, that it collapses to a lower dimensional subspace, and let's say that's k-dimensional, then I'm going to consider a cylindrical thickening, and this is given by kt. So basically, we take the Minkowski sum of q naught with uh, some small scaling of a n minus k-dimensional ball. Okay, so this n minus k dimensional ball is going to be in the complementary subspace to the one that Q naught spans if we're assuming that it collapses to a k dimensional space. Okay, so yes, contradiction approach. 
And we will obtain the contradiction by showing that the maximality of Q0 is contradicted. So in other words, that the cylindrical thickening, um, if we evaluate the functional at this body, it will be strictly greater than the functional evaluated at the supposed maximizer. Uh, and for some small t greater than zero. Okay, uh, we break this step down further into two sub steps to make things a bit easier. So first we will show that this ratio in the limit as um, t approaches zero is going to approach one. And secondly, we will show that the derivative uh, for small t where t equal to zero is, is going to be strictly greater than zero. So these two together will give us our contradiction. Um, yeah, and so it's pretty evident that this would involve a bunch of estimates, um, and this was the most challenging part of the proof. Uh, so first, I split up the ratio here um, into the product of two terms. So I separated out the radio function term and the support function terms, and proved um, that basically these estimates hold. Okay, so yes, let's say delta two tilde is just some functional that's always less than delta two at every p positive. Um, and the same sort of idea for delta one tilde. Um, then basically I found that the limit as t approaches zero uh, for these ratios are going to approach one. Um, so basically this these two will take care of this step here. Um, and then now we have to find uh, estimates on the differentials of these terms. So basically, we are differentiating delta 2 tilde. And if we take the limit as t approaches 0, we will end up with something proportionate to t to the minus p minus 1. So remember, we're assuming that p is between 0 and minus 1 which means that as t approaches 0, uh, this term is going to approach infinity. OK? And yeah, same sort of for delta 1 tilde. Uh, separate the q cases into three different cases um, and found these estimates here on the differentials. OK, so yes, uh, t approaches 0 means that uh, for these two cases, we're going to approach minus infinity. And basically, all we need to do is to just sort of ensure that this grows faster than this decreases uh, in order to get this derivative being positive here. OK, and this is exactly where the assumptions on p and q come in. So this is to ensure the positivity of, sorry, the derivative. OK, um, so if we guarantee this, uh, we will contradict uh, maximality of um, the optimizer that we assume to collapse. So therefore, it cannot collapse. And uh, the limit is uh, cannot degenerate. And existence is proved. OK, so um, there are several open problems still um, in this uh, question of the LP dual Minkowski problem. So this entire time, I've been assuming origin symmetry. Uh, this was pretty crucial to the proof. Um, but it would be nice to know whether one can eliminate this assumption. Um, yeah, a pretty difficult problem. Uh, I think it will involve probably finding a different optimization functional um, maybe a min-max approach to uh, achieve this uh, solution. And um, there are still several missing cases in the fourth quadrant uh, of the LP dual Minkowski problem, and namely uh, these cases. So when P is less than or equal to zero and Q is greater than or equal to one, um, nothing is known. And um, this whole time, we've been discussing existence uh, to the LP dual Minkowski problem, but it's also natural to wonder about the uniqueness of the solution. So uh, recently, uh, Xi and Zhang in uh, proceedings, I think, no, transactions paper, um, they prove the P greater than or equal to Q case 
Um, so they were able to find some uniqueness conditions for the LP dual Minkowski problem for P greater than or equal to Q, but the P less than Q case is uh, still widely unsolved. So namely, uh, the longstanding open question of the uh, log from Minkowski inequality is included within this region. So perhaps solving some cases here uh, would give some sort of a hint on how to approach uh, that question. Okay, so um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much uh, for a great talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, I will stop the recording and ask again. Some people might be shy. <laughs>